To the left of the interface is the Edit Desk Library. This contains the source areas and bins where our media is contained. The one I'm looking for is at the bottom which is called Action Comp. Now currently I don't see the contents of Action Comp on the main desktop. The way we do this is by looking at the View column located next to each one of the source area entries. You can see the View option is currently set to View Basic Editing. So if I was to click where it says Action Comp in the View column, you can now see we're now looking at all the contents that are contained inside the Action Comp bin. These are the contents that we're going to use to build a composite inside the Action 3D Compositor. Now if you do not see the Action button in the middle of the interface, chances are you might still have your editing menus turned on. So if you see the blue LED here, simply just tap on it and you should notice the Action button appear in the interface. Let's select this Action button and all the menus at the bottom disappear except for a pop-up. Now the pop-up might say Front, Back and Matte, but if you click on this pop-up and hold it down, you have a various different options. Choose the None option. Now before clicking on the desktop, you can see we now have got a white cursor. Now what I'd like you to do is hold down the Alt button on the keyboard and then click the white cursor on the desktop. By doing that operation, it flushes out any old settings inside of Action and starts us off really new and fresh. The first part of the Action interface you will see is the node bins. The node bins basically show us all the tools that we have available to us inside of Action. It's currently tabbed at All Nodes, so if you switch from the All Nodes tab to the Objects tab, it gives us a much more consolidated tool set and enough tools that we're going to use to build up our composition. Now the first thing we're going to do is bring in our elements. So we're going to go to the left of the interface and switch from the Node bin to the Media menu. In the Media menu, we can then begin to load in our elements. So the first thing we're going to load is the background. In the middle of the interface is the Media list. You can see that there is a value called B which obviously stands for background. Next to the B letter you can see that there's a name column which is currently empty. What you can do is double click on that column and it takes you back out to the desktop. You will notice I now have a green cursor. So when loading images into action it is color coded. Green always stands for background. So we need to take the clip labeled background into the compositor. In order for you to load a clip into action, you have to click on a very specific part of the clip. The way you load the clips in is by taking the cursor and clicking on the time code on the top left hand corner of the clip. If you click anywhere else, it will not load the clip into action. The first thing to note is you'll now see how our footage has been loaded into the background and the number in brackets signifies the length of that clip. So in this case the background is 155 frames in length. In order to make sure our composite is exactly the same length, we can come to the right of the play controls where we see the duration value which is currently set to 1. If we were to click on this number 1, we can then use the on-screen calculator to enter in a value of 155 which means that the duration of the composite now matches the duration of the background. What we can now do is we can now grab the time bar under the play controls and you can scrub it backwards and forwards. You can see that we've got a zooming shot in the aircraft cabin. Now just make sure you return back to frame 1. Let's go ahead and load in the other elements for the scene. To the left of the media list you can see there is a button labeled New Media. If you click on it, it takes you back to the desktop and you're presented with a red cursor. The red cursor indicates a fill or a front that we're about to load. We will go ahead and load in a clip labeled CC Front and remember to click on the top left hand time code on the clip. When you click this, the cursor now turns blue. The blue cursor indicates an alpha or a mat that will work with the corresponding fill. In this case, we go to the clip underneath it which is called CC Front Alpha and we can go ahead and click on the time code once again on the top left hand corner of the clip. You can see how the composite now creates itself inside of Action. If you wish to key this, you can see that there is a keying column available in the media list. 
Now, since we've already keyed a shot in the timeline, it's exactly the same tools and processes available inside of Action as well. So currently, if we were to take the time bar and scrub it backwards and forwards, the one thing that you will note is that the background is moving, but the actual green screen shot is static. Hence, you'll notice a lot of slipping as well as him not matching into the actual camera move. So what we need to do is we need to match the camera move of the background against the image we have just brought in. In order to do this, we're going to use another tool inside of Action called the Schematic View. To view the Schematic View, we're going to change the way that Action is functioning. By pressing Alt 2 on the keyboard, we'll create what we call a dual screen split. On the right hand side, you can see I've got my camera result and on the left hand side, I have the Schematic View. The schematic view gives me the objects that exist inside my scene. So as you can see, we have an image, which is our green screen talent, and attached to that image is a tool called the axis. The axis might be known as an animation controller or possibly a null object to some other applications, but it contains animation. The schematic also allows us to connect various nodes together to drive animation and create all sorts of different behaviors. So we're going to create another axis or animation controller to do the tracking for us. To do this, we're going to go from the media menu back to the node bin. In the middle of the node bin, you'll see that there is a node called axis. Simply by double clicking on this node, it gets added into the schematic view. Now currently, axis 2 has no relationship to axis 1. So we need to connect the two in order to have animation from Axis 2 drive Axis 1 and its image. In order to connect the axes together, we simply hover our cursor over Axis 2 and start moving the cursor towards the edge. You will see how the cursor changes from a blue cross to a black arrow. When we see the black arrow, we simply click and drag a connection out of Axis 2 and connect it into Axis 1. You can see how a connection has been created. At any time, if you wish to break the connection, simply click on the gray area and draw a red line across the connection and release. This will then break the connection between the two axis nodes. Once again, get the black cursor over axis 2, click and drag and connect it into axis 1 to establish a connection. Now what we're going to do is with axis 2, double click on it and this will bring up the object menu of axis 2 at the bottom of the interface. So this controls the transformation controls of that specific animation controller. In the middle of the Axis 2 controls, you can see we have got our tracking tools. Now since the shot is scaling up, we want to track position, but also scaling as well. So under the tracking column, you will see there's an option that says scale off. If we click on this pop-up, we can then choose scale on. To enter into the tracking tools, simply click the stabilizer button with the little arrow which will then launch us into the tracking menu. Now inside the tracking menu, it's working with a standard 2D track in order for us to actually analyze the movement. You will see in the center of the image we have the square boxes and these square boxes are our tracking markers. To set the trackers up, position the cursor in the middle of the first tracking box and click down you will see that a magnifying glass has appeared and we're going to position the first tracking box on the little light located to the top left of the door. You can then release the pen and it will position the tracker. Back in the middle of the image, you can see that there is a second tracking box and as before, if we position the cursor in the middle of the box, when we click down, we get the magnifying box and we can then drag this up to the light on the top right hand side of the door. You can now see how we've now positioned both tracking boxes on a suitable point to get a good track. Now make sure that we're actually at frame 1 and we press the Analyze button. You will see how Smoke will then do the track using subpixel tracking. Once the tracking data has been complete, we can go ahead and press the Return button to the left of the interface to exit the tracking tool. You will notice straight away that if you were to scrub the time bar, that the subject has now got the same movement as the camera, and the little blue lines in the time bar indicate that there are keyframes on all the frames of the selected axis too. What we now need to do is we now need to reposition the subject back into the background plate. 
In order to do this, in the schematic view, we select axis one by clicking on it once, and under the position controls, we can set various values. So for example, if we set X to 100, and we press return, and we'll also set Y to minus 100, we can then position him inside our scene, and if I scrub the time bar one more time, you will see how that that particular person has now got exactly the same movement as the background and he's nicely positioned inside our scene.